Join Time Magazine's lead education reporter alongside global educators and advocates to explore the impacts of teaching forgiveness. I teach forgiveness because it can have a positive impact in my students' families. It helps my students thrive in the face of adversity. Students who can forgive are happier. Join us to hear from teachers and thought leaders on how and why to include forgiveness in your classroom. Temperature rise will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water.
Hello and welcome everyone. It is so great to have many of you here watching from all around the world. My name is Eddie Wu and it's a great pleasure to have you here as this uh, in this World Education Week event. Uh, today's session that you're having with me is entitled Improving Student Engagement Through Research-Based Teaching Strategies and I am a teacher at Cherrybrook Technology High School in Sydney, Australia. Uh, it's such a joy to um, be able to share practice with you. And before I get stuck into uh, what we're going to be having a look at today, I just want to make sure you've got a clear sense of who I am and why I'm speaking about this. As I mentioned before, I'm a teacher in high school, so I teach grades 7 to 12 in Sydney, and I have done so for 15 years. The current school where I'm at, Traybrook Technology High School, is where I teach mathematics. Um, but I also work for the New South Wales, the State Department of Education, and provide support to schools around our state and our country. And in fact, uh, when I'm not in the classroom, I've had the privilege prior to COVID um, of being able to travel and share practice with the rest of the world. So this is a time when I was working in Uganda. Um, I had the privilege of speaking to educators in Malaysia, and this was a shot from me working with some educators in Taiwan. And so for me to be part of this global community today is really exciting, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to speak. Now, this morning, uh, I have an outline for you so that you can keep track of where we're up to. Uh, I'm going to uh, just introduce sort of myself and I'm going to talk a little more in detail about my own work as we go through this story. Um, but I kind of have three acts uh, in this story to talk about. The title of this was talking about student engagement. So I want to talk about the value and the means by which we've been able to connect with students. And I want to tell you a very personal story that has to do with my practice and how I've achieved that in the mathematics classroom. I then want to kind of expand the view and go just from my own classroom to an entire community, my school's community, and the kinds of ways that we are addressing student engagement challenges uh, and also meeting success in that sphere. So that's going to be looking at the school, and then I want to cast my net um, even wider and have a look at uh, across my state, New South Wales, and about amplifying really great practice through instructional leadership, which I think is a very fitting theme for World Education Week. We'll then have a Q&A at the end, and even though I will prompt you at that moment, uh, you're welcome to post your questions in the chat uh, at any time, and I can see a few people who've already put some things in there. Uh, thank you to, to Eric and Vikas. It's a great pleasure um, to be part of this with you, and T4 Education has done an incredible job um, putting this series of events together, celebrating educators from around the world. So as I mentioned, we're going to be looking from a teacher scale, then to a school, and then finally across a state jurisdiction. And uh, you can see down there, I've popped in my um, social media details, they're always the same, I'm quite easy to find. Um, and the reason why I put those down there is in case you wanna know more or you wanna get in touch, I'm very happy to share all the content and slides, um, especially because some of them are quite detailed and I don't want you to feel like you've missed something important. Um, I'm very happy to send that through all afterwards. So in case you'd like that, um, those details will come up again at the end. So. And without further ado, let's have a look at this first idea of how to deepen student engagement and what it looks like in my classroom. To help you explain um, a little bit of a sense of, of how and why I've done this, I need to tell you a story. And it begins about 10 years ago. This building is uh, part of Sydney where I live. It's about 20 minutes uh, drive from my house. Uh, and it's a place of um, great hope, but also great challenge. Um, this is Westmead Children's Hospital. And it's a place where um, many of uh, the students whom we teach spend many you know, hours, days, weeks, and months of their life if they are being treated for serious conditions. And the reason why I'm showing you this picture is because about 10 years ago, one of my students was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And so sadly, he was uh, immediately pulled from school to begin chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatment for this cancer. Now, for us as educators, when this happens to our students, and it might not be a serious illness, it might be um, a move or it might be particular challenges in their family circumstances, um, we as educators know that engagement at this time is an immense challenge and something which uh, many of us would say is impossible because there are so many things swirling around a child's life during their, their dark days. Um, keeping them engaged with learning can seem like a distant and uh, remote goal. Um, but for me, I actually had a memory from when I was the age of this young man. He was 16 years old when he was diagnosed. 
I had the memory of not myself, but my mother being diagnosed with lung cancer and the impact that that had on my family. And one of the memories that I had was of wanting to remain engaged with my peers, with my community and with learning, which is something which I got great joy from. And so what I wanted to do for this student was to try and make sure that even though he was not going to be at school, even when he was in a hospital, he was immune compromised, um, a phrase which means so much more now to us within this pandemic than it ever did before. And so he couldn't even be physically at school with us. And I thought, Surely there is something better that we can provide to this young man than just to be able to give him a textbook and say, good luck, we hope you can keep up. So what I did was partly inspired by things like Khan Academy, um, I decided to take uh, the phone out of my pocket and use it to just take video of the lessons that I taught. But I did it a little bit differently to Khan Academy. Um, Khan Academy is well, um, well known these days, but for those of you who haven't seen it before, um, the idea of it is very simple. Um, Sal Khan started out just writing on his computer and you can see this is his desktop and he was going to be you know, sharing lessons about science or mathematics. And he was just doing this to his cousins across the other side of the country. Uh, and this was something which he was doing, not being a professional educator. Um, my commonality with him is using video to help people learn, but it looks very different because my video comes from within my classroom. Uh, this actually is a screen grab from one of the videos that I taught, and that's my classroom there in the background. And one of the things which I find quite amusing about this is that it started out so simply, um, but my students started to grab a hold of it. Uh, one of my students actually said to me one time, Mr. Wu, did you know you wave your arms around a lot when you talk? And I said, are you sure? Really? I don't feel like I wave my arms around a lot. And he said, yeah, I think you do. And I thought that was the end of the conversation. But the next day he came back brandishing his computer and he showed me this screenshot and he said, no, Mr. Wu, you really do wave your arms around a lot. And I said, okay, fair game. Uh, that evidence is hard to argue with. So this classroom practice that I just shared, it's live. You can hear students speaking and asking questions in the classroom. Um, it's it's a transparent experience of what it is like to be in, in the learning environment with my students. And when I mean trans, when I say transparent, I really mean it. Um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, I have been teaching and learning a lot from home. And so if you have a look at some of the recent videos, you will see me on this exact background. Here I am in my house and I'm writing on uh, my iPad, which I can then display to my students. So this is how it all began. And what I found most amazing about this was that it was powerfully uh, able to engage students. And when I started to put these videos across, you can see some of them in my classroom and some of them from at home. Um, what I found was that it wasn't just um, this one student of mine who uh, was getting benefit out of this. Actually, even the students in the classroom who were there during the lesson were actually engaged in the learning and they were engaged with these videos by using it for revision. Um, students who were not in my class were finding these really helpful ways to supplement the learning they were getting from their own teachers. And so I continued doing this long after this student of mine left, as you can see. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of this because I don't just think that this is engaging students. I know, and being a mathematics teacher or any teacher for that matter, I have data to back me up. What you're having a look at here is a screenshot from the um, statistics dashboard in my YouTube channel. And it's just a, a very narrow slice of the data that I have access to. But this data, it tells a story. And I know there's a lot here to look at and to take in. Um, the first thing I will mention is that, as I mentioned, as I sort of referred to before, for. Uh, I, I love being able to interact with the global community and that's what um, putting my videos online has partly enabled me to do. You can see this is just the first few countries ranked in order of um, how much use and traffic there is on my channel, but the list actually goes many, many pages down. That's the first thing I want you to notice. The second thing is that a lot of people's attention is drawn by this number. Um, this number gets a lot of press. Um, when I go to um, you know, deliver at a conference or present or something like that, often this number, 90 90 million views, it, it really gets people's attention. They say, wow, that's an astonishing achievement. And I am grateful for that. It does sort of boggle my mind, even being a mathematics teacher, a number that large is quite hard to wrap my head around. But in fact, that number is not really the one that I focus on. It's actually this number right beside it. This is what YouTube calls watch time. So if you have watched a video on your phone, 
YouTube knows when you click off that video, when you swipe up, when you stop watching, when you decide to watch something else, they track not just the fact that you've watched a video, but how long you are watching it for. And if you look closely at that number, think about this for a second, 5.6 million hours. What does that actually mean in the terms of an educator? Can you wrap your head around that length of time? Well, I thought I should try and crunch the numbers on this and do some of the mathematics to try and understand what 5.6 million hours means as an educator. So I thought about what it's like in my school. Uh, I teach in a high school, as I mentioned before, and so the bell goes six times a day to start mark the beginning and the end of a lesson. And so each period length, each lesson is on average about 51 minutes long. So it's between 50 minutes and an hour. It varies a little bit from day to day. Now, in Australia, the in the part of uh, Australia that I teach, New South Wales, the normal weekly teaching load for a high school teacher is 22 and a half of those lessons, which are about 50 minutes. So if you do just the straight multiplication um, of that times 40 weeks in a school year, you turn up with 768 hours. 768 hours of a teacher being face to face with their students. Now, do you remember that other number that we saw before? 5.6 million hours? Well, if we take 5.6 million hours and think of it in terms of how many years that would take for a human teacher face to face to actually teach that, it comes up with a staggering, maybe you're trying to crunch the numbers now, they're a bit big for your mind to contemplate, a staggering 7,300 years. That's how long it would physically take me to teach such that I had been face to face with my students for the amount of time that my videos have been watched on YouTube. Now, I don't know if you hear that number and you think, hold on a second, really? Um, does that does that seem accurate or, or even possible? I know when I first looked at this, one of the things that mathematics teachers do is we say, does their answer make sense? Is it reasonable? And this sounded unreasonable to me. So I thought maybe I can try and solve this problem another way. Maybe watch time is not the key metric. Perhaps we should think instead about the number of students being impacted because, you know, uh, that 5.6 million hours is 5.6 million hours for a single individual. So I thought maybe I should think about this in terms of the number of people who are actually being reached here. As of the time when I put together these slides a few days ago, um, I had about 1.3 million people who were subscribed to watch my videos. Every time I put one up, it goes straight to them. And that happens every day. I release a video um, once a day. Now, in Australia, our average class size is about 30. I know that varies around the world, um, but here in Sydney, it would take uh, 43,000 classes to end up with that 1.3 million number that I had before. Now, again, thinking about how many classes a student, uh, a teacher takes uh, in a normal year, that's five classes. So it would take me more than 8,000 years to teach that number of human beings. So that number before of 7,000, maybe it was a bit conservative. It actually might be even bigger than that, the impact. And I never know, you know, sometimes a single person watching is actually a teacher who is then going to teach um, their own classes or actually is broadcasting it to a lecture theatre. So these are the kinds of things which amaze me. Now, I mentioned right early on that this, this sort of started very humbly and I started to realise because people were posting online that it wasn't just students who were watching, it's actually teachers too. And so um, this YouTube channel grew, I created a second channel um, which is dedicated just to teachers and in the next section, we're in section one at the moment, student engagement, um, I'll talk a bit more about the impact of this uh, teacher channel as well. Now, in the title of this workshop, you may have noticed that I wanted to talk about this being um, evidence based and research based. So in each of our three points, talking about student engagement, um, impact across a community and then instructional leadership, I want to focus on the research and evidence base. And when we talk about, I thought about many ways that I could explain this. Um, I, I don't have too many uh, opportunities here in terms of time, but the first place my ma mind went was cognitive load theory, which um, uh, Sweller and his uh, colleagues 
uh, they've written so much about, and perhaps you're familiar with cognitive load theory as well. One of the things that is really important in it is the idea of well-organized knowledge, which is the most efficient way to go into a student or a teacher's long-term memory. And I think that is part of why these videos are uh, having provided to people all around the world are so engaging. Because things have already been categorized and they are already tested for effectiveness and for e efficacy within the classroom. Um, some people have said to me, um, Eddie, how do you make videos that are engaging? Why are so many people watching? And for many, many years, I had no concrete answer to this question. Um, but I came to realize that the reason why so many people watch the videos is because I'm being tested for efficacy in the classroom live as I present. So if it wasn't good in the first place, then in the classroom, as every educator would, I modify and I I adapt so that it actually makes sense to my students and that's why it actually makes sense to people when they watch afterwards. So I think the research backs why this is engaging and it's really inf important for me to provide this borrowed information in a way that's actually helpful and accessible and digestible. So that was looking just within my classroom, but as a leader, and I know many of the people tuning in now are also educators who have impact across a system or across a school, I wanted to broaden the impact of that teaching practice across my community. So I wanted to try and take these ideas and think about how to engage students in a form that was appropriate for an entire school. So let me tell you a bit more about my school. Cherrybrook Technology High School is a comprehensive government school. So that means that everyone who is within a certain geographical catchment area is entitled to um, enroll within our school and we cannot turn them away. We're very happy to have a broad range of students. Uh, we have a population of about 2000 students which in uh, which in Australian terms is quite large, though I know compared to other jurisdictions around the world, that might be average or even small, depending on where you live and teach. And uh, within those 2000 students, approximately two thirds of our students uh, have a language background other than English. So um, we have a lot of cultural and linguistic diversity across the school. And you can even see that in these couple of pictures here, though um, that uh, man in the sharp suit there is my principal, Gary Johnson, uh, and that's why you can see him featured there in our library and with our school leaders. Now, Cherrybrook Technology High School is a very academically competitive and rigorous school. And so one of the um, myths that is often held within such an environment is that competition and rivalry are what drives our students' achievement. Now, to some extent, that is probably true. I know many students are motivated by competing with their peers. But one of the things which I found really, really clear from the research base, and again, at the end of this point, I'll refer to that specifically, is how important collaboration is among such students that it is also not just a powerful motivator but a powerful mechanism for driving student achievement it doesn't just help us want it it helps us to actually obtain it so what did that look like how do we implement it well a couple of different ways number one as a collaborator with staff, I mentioned that teacher YouTube channel that I had before. Um, this is one of my colleagues. You can see her videos. That's definitely not me with a different haircut being featured on my YouTube channel. And one of the things that was delightful was to see other educators be willing to share their practice in a very open and public forum. So that's one of the first examples. But a second example and what I wanted to spend a bit more time talking about is something that we called Maths Pass. Uh, Maths Pass is an acronym stands for peer assisted study sessions and you're having a look at a maths pass uh, session right now um, you have uh, many students in a lunchtime of their own volunteering time uh, voluntarily they have taken their time to uh, help their peers and if you look closely at this image you'll see them all seated in pairs each time there is a senior student someone in either year 11 or year 12 so they're you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, and they're helping a younger student generally in year seven who might be 12 or 13. And so that's why you can see them paired up in each case. So that's why they're peer assisted. And we found this really important to access for student engagement because we wanted not only um, younger students to have access to help, but also the older students, we view them as engaged very deeply with trying to understand a concept when they are required to explain it. And for us, this is a really powerful metaphor. Um, we think about how it is that students struggle and learn and the whole idea of productive struggle. And if you are trying to, you know, 
surface, uh, climb across a surface that is challenging to you, often the people who are most able to help you are the people who have done this struggle quite recently. And whilst it is the, the job and the focus of every educator to make sure that we stay able to empathize with our students, there is a particular quality that is very powerful and very difficult to imitate when you yourself have learned something quite recently. So this idea of, you know, these peers climbing the wall of learning together is something that we embodied in MassPass. So what was the impact of this? I want to talk about uh, this idea from a student perspective because I think it's very valuable uh, and it also shows the importance of listening to student voices we'll get to in a second. When we first ran this, um, I know some of the teachers who I spoke with, they said, how will you get people to do this? Are you going to pay? Are you going, how are you going to reward such students so that they'll be motivated to take on this program because they're doing it in and of themselves and they are you know, providing their time voluntarily, like I mentioned before. We had 35 students, which is about 10% of the grade, sign up in our first year. But you can see in subsequent years, year two and year three, year on year, we had more and more applicants until almost a quarter of our year 11 grade actually applied to sign up. And for us, the clearly compelling reason was that as students went from year 11 into year 12, those students who had been our tutors spoke about the value of the program to the students who were younger in the year below them, that it was a wonderful opportunity for them to clarify their own learning, to challenge themselves, do they really understand something? As Richard Feynman said, you do not understand something truly until you can explain it simply. And so for us to see that word of mouth expand meant that what, there wasn't just demand from younger students, but there was actually willingness and growing willingness from older students. So we then expanded it from, uh, we originally offered it on Tuesdays and Fridays. We then offered it on a third uh, lunchtime as well. And we introduced you know, a drop-in session where students could actually come without booking and there would always be someone ready for them rather than their allocated mentor or peer tutor that they had every single time. Now, I said it was really important to talk about this from a student voice point of view as well. And for us, speaking and to and interviewing these students and understanding, you know, what was their sense from um, actually having participated in this program of the value of it? These are some of the youngest students uh, who actually participated speaking. And I just love this, this third one, this third quote that I want to read to you. Um, this student said, I just wanted to thank uh, you to my tutor for helping me and making me more comfortable uh, and able to better understand different things in maths. And what I love about that quote so much is that it captures that learning is not merely an academic pursuit. It is also about mindset and disposition. Um, mathematics is a subject that makes students and adults, I should say, anxious a lot of the time. It is a subject that often is associated with speed and performance, and it can be something which is nerve wracking as an experience for many people. And so one of the key benefits of this program is that it helps students feel comfortable with mathematics, which opened the space for them to actually engage with the thinking, which was something we really loved to see. So as I've been doing so far, I want to come back to this research base, right? So at this point, I want to refer to the work of Niskojko and colleagues in memory and cognition. And this idea of reciprocal teaching is very powerful. Um, students who'd been expecting to teach material to someone else, so they had been said, you know, told, you know, you're going to have um, uh, the opportunity in the future to actually teach and explain this material you're learning. They actually remembered more and performed better in assessment tasks than students who were told they would have an assessment task. And I just want you to think about how counterintuitive that is. Students who were told that they would have a test. They revised, they studied, they prepared, but those students who were actually preparing to explain did better on the test than students who were actively, purposefully preparing for the test itself, which says something about what our own view is about how we think we should prepare for tests. Uh, it is uh, you know, a reality of the world that there are many kinds of assessment tasks and examinations we have to face, but it seems interesting to me that the actual methods that help us can be sometimes counterintuitive and the data backs that very consistently. So, uh, I want to make sure we have time for Q&A and I've seen some of the comments coming through so I just want to remind you now if you have any questions about any of the ideas that I'm presenting please pop them in the q and I'd be happy to address them. I want to now zoom out one last time we looked at 
student engagement within my classroom. We looked at mechanisms for student engagement in a, a school community that I've been leading. And now I want to blow the doors open. I want to talk about amplifying practice across the state through a model of instructional leadership. And then this will take us to the Q&A. One of the things I, I get to participate in is the idea that uh, not just the students in my classroom or the students in my school, but the students um, in every school that I get to interact with. And there are about 2,200 schools across New South Wales, both primary and secondary. Um, for me as a leader, and I'm, I'm thinking about the leaders who are here in the room with us, we, we know that practice has to extend beyond the, the little community that we actually get to interact with on a daily basis. And so as a mathematics leader within my system, one of the things that I've been able to contribute to is something called the New South Wales Mathematics Strategy, which if you uh, pop that into a search engine, you'll be able to find lots of documentation on it. And I just want you to give get a, a small snapshot of this. Now, student engagement and uh, learning outcomes in mathematics, they don't sit in a vacuum. Obviously, the key drivers, um, you know, the main uh, areas of impact when you think about effect size come from high quality teaching. So this is a secondary goal, which you can see there in the middle. Um, but even that does not happen in isolation. It isn't just within the school between students and teachers. There are community attitudes toward mathematics from parents, from industry, from role models in society and culture, which are hugely important in shaping students' mindset and therefore their attitude and, and work ethic toward mathematics. And so the New South Wales Mathematics Strategy takes these three goals and breaks them apart into these different components. Now, this diagram here has far too much for me to speak to in detail. So you're welcome to um, you know get in contact and request these slides afterwards if you're interested or see the event recording if you want to scrutinize this a little more closely. But the part of this that I want you to focus on in particular is down here in the bottom right hand corner where it says teachers of mathematics have easier access to quality development opportunities and pathways that support their professional growth in mathematics teaching. As an educator and a leader, this is my passion. And I wanna make sure that not only in my classroom are students learning effectively or in my school, but that all teachers everywhere have access to resources and professional learning that will support them to support their own students. And so I thought about professional learning structures and the common structures that we use and their pros and cons, their advantages and disadvantages. Um, even though these are not, this is not an exhaustive list, I do think that they cover the vast majority of different professional learning modes. We often have expert consultants, um, you know, people who we uh, either are educators or who are, um, you know, people who have been educators in the past and who are brought into our schools or into our systems, consultants. We also attend conferences. I mean, we're all in here one right now, which uh, is very exciting and we get to learn from that and be exposed to new ideas. And there's a huge deal, degree of self-directed research that educators engage with. Now, each of these systems has their own advantages and disadvantages. You can see several of them here. But one of the things that I was very conscious of is that, you know, self-directed research is by its nature something that cannot be uh, brought in from the outside. It has to be self-determined. It has to be driven by the educator themselves. And so as a system leader, thinking about, well, what kind of things can I provide? What kind of structures can I um, give to the teachers I support? I think about these first two levels and I think, well, one of the impacts, uh, one of the challenges here is that there's always going to be a generalized nature to consultants and conferences. Um, I've spoken at conferences before and I've been a consultant before. And one of the um, biggest challenges is that you have to speak broadly enough that, a, that everyone who you're speaking to can get some value out of what you're saying. And if you're speaking to a room of 500 or 1000 educators, that is going to be necessarily ignorant of context. You can give some specific examples there, but they are always going to be narrow and you're never going to dwell on them too long because otherwise they would be irrelevant to the vast majority of the people who are listening to you. And so I wanted to create and, and sort of based on the jurisdictions I've seen around the world and the instructional leadership models that I have witnessed, I wanted to create something that would provide a counterpoint to that generalized professional learning. And that is where my team, which you can see here on the map of New South Wales, that's where my team steps in. Uh, these uh, mathematics instructional leaders, each of them is a secondary mathematics teacher, and the team that they make up is called the mathematics growth team. They are each based in a specific school community and context. And for 
for us to be able to say, we want you to know that school really well, to know the community, to understand its particular needs of the students and the teachers and the parents, um, to understand that and get in the weeds, in the details, um, getting your hands dirty, as it were, um, to understand, you know, what are the particular things that I can help this community with, that sort of helps us get around this generalized nature of a lot of the professional learning structures that otherwise exist. And I'm so proud of my team and what they've achieved through their roles. So let me try and explain what this looks like. On the mathematics growth team, as I mentioned, every single one of my team members is school based. They are at an executive classification because curriculum leadership, whilst it is not administrative or supervisory, it is nonetheless uh, a leadership role which is crucial within the school. And so that's why we um, classify them and we include them as part of the school executive so that everyone sees their crucial leadership um, responsibilities. Now, there is a, a division between uh, the two responsibilities of each teacher between teaching in the classroom and delivery of professional learning. And you can see the 1.0, the full um, load that they have is split to be 40% in the classroom and 60% professional learning. And many of the professional learning roles, consultant roles, advisor roles that exist within education um, take teachers out of the classroom. And I view this as problematic in several ways. Number one, um, the best educators generally want to remain in the classroom. And so roles that do not have or do not retain this significant component um, often do not attract people who actually love being in the classroom. And those are the ones whose practice we want to amplify. Um, secondly, it is so easy once we leave the classroom to forget some of the issues and some of the, and, and, and lack some of the currency um, with you know the implementation of a new syllabus or new curriculum structures. These are things which need to be kept up to date and are very easily lost. And also other teachers are very quick to judge someone who does not have authentic practice, cannot demonstrate authentic practice themselves. Uh, we already talked about the instructional leadership component there. You can see see some details there in the rationale on the right. And the other key component I wanted to highlight now is that these are roles that are appointed for a minimum of a year. Now, consultants generally come in, maybe they spend some time at the start of the year, a week, and then, you know, if you have enough funds in your school budget, maybe a week later on in the year, and that would be generally regarded as, you know, quite, you know, su significant support. But we actually have this teacher based in the school for a minimum of 12 months, and often it's actually 24. And so that longitudinal um, design is really important for us. Now, this is a slide that's not designed to be spoken to. It's designed for you um, to come back to this recording later on, or if you want to request the slides, you can do that. Um, but for us, it's really important to take this idea that I've been speaking about throughout this workshop, um, talking about taking theory, research and evidence and bring that into practice. Um, we want to mobilize expert teachers to take their experience and expertise and share that with other educators. <coughs> Excuse me. We want them to participate and deliver and design uh, professional learning that is high impact. And we have so much evidence around what high impact professional learning actually looks like. And then we want to deepen the evidence base that they're working off of through their own practice so that we can scale it across a system. We don't want it to be isolated in little pockets because that's something which education systems around the world struggle with, particularly as our jurisdictions get larger and larger. Now, the Maths Growth Team is marked by several different characteristics, and I could speak about any single one of these for an hour, but I won't because we don't have the time. I'm just going to emphasize a couple of them. Um, the first one you can see up there in the top right hand corner is about loving learning. Um, every one of our um, leaders, we think what makes, what drives them is that they themselves still find joy and passion for learning themselves. And they have to because they need to engage with the research in a really substantive way to perform their roles. Over there also in the top right hand corner, this idea of being participant focused. So uh, one of the things that we say within our team is that you have to equip and provide support to the teachers you're working with so that they can make their own choices and be able to exercise their own professional judgment and critique all of the different strategies and programs and resources that are available to them. This is really important. This is really key because otherwise the change that gets introduced while our team members at the school is not sustainable. 
sustainable. Once we remove that instructional leader, if they have not developed the capacity for the participants in professional learning themselves to make choices, then all of that momentum will be lost. So we think it's really crucial that the participants themselves are actually equipped to uh, make those decisions once the instructional leader leaves. And then the last uh, point that I want to emphasize here, if you just wrap around clockwise to pedagogy driven, um, we know that there are many programs uh, whose professional learning is based around a product. Perhaps it is a text or a technology or some other kind of material. Now, while you make use of all of those different resources, we're always clear that each of them is just a, it's just a hollow shell. What you do with an interactive whiteboard or a one-to-one -one laptop program or a particular textbook, None of that matters unless the pedagogy is actually carefully designed to take advantage of that resource and its strengths. Uh, we are not interested in rolling out products, even though products are used all the time in our professional learning. We are interested in helping teachers understand the pedagogy that makes a product work because then they will adapt to whatever products they have um, access to. And that's really vital, again, from an equity and an accessibility point of view. Now, we're coming close to the end here. I'm mindful of time, and I want to make sure that we have some time for those questions, and I've seen a few coming through. I just wanted to highlight that this, uh, you know, positioning of our teachers within a specific school context is to enable them to provide tailored support. So we we ask them actually, we say minimum 12 months for you to work in a school, the entirety of the first term of which there are four in New South Wales schools. So the, the first quarter of the year is spent on understanding the school context. So we want them to form deep relationships and really get to know these teachers, spend time in their classrooms and to support the school structure and staffing according to their needs, which takes a lot of time when you're coming from the outside to actually learn. And professional dialogue is really important to that. It's got to be responsive. It's got to be about not just delivering professional learning, but also listening. That's why I had the, the word attentive there uh, on my previous slide. And so to think about what that actually looks like, let me give you an example from the data that we actually record. Um, this is something called a diary, which uh, we have our team members keep. And we run sometimes official, you know, uh, formal workshops, but other times there are just conversations that happen, little dialogue pieces between teachers that focus on different topics. And we have our our mathematics growth team members actually recording that. You know, are they focused on uh, pedagogical research? Are they talking about mathematical mindsets or about ICT, you know, information and communication technology in the classroom or formative assessment? So you can see here, this is um, ranked by order of the instances. So mathematical uh, content and collaboration between staff come up top and then total time hours on the right hand side is what you can see everything has been um, ordered in accordance to. And so for us to have this data to, to back what is the actual tailored support that our teachers need is really vital. Now, I talked about dialogue before, but it's very important. We've seen in the research, this is um, Coburn and Russell, if you want to look this up, um, talking about the depth of talk in social networks of teachers. Um, one of the things that's really important to us is to recognize that there is some kinds of dialogue that differs in depth and detail to other kinds of dialogue. So this particular model here, going from the top of the page down to the bottom, talks about shallow, superficial, um, low depth of talk to then sort of deeper, more substantial and, and more cognitively intense depth of talk down the bottom of the page. And our research has shown that um, perhaps unsurprisingly, but worryingly, the vast majority of conversations with other teachers within the faculty is of a fairly superficial nature. It's administrative, it's about processes, and we often do not make the time for conversations at a deeper level around why teachers are learning or how it is that we select different resources for different classes and why we do that. And so what we are aiming to focus on is deepening that, that level of talk. And that's something that our instructional leaders are actually pushing and driving within the school. And you can't do that unless you know the teachers and have a, a strong relationship with them. So to close things out, um, as I've been doing, I want to talk about the research for that backs this. And this time, because it's my final one, I'm actually going to give you three pieces of research very briefly that address this and then we'll head into the questions. 
I want to talk about Clark and Peterson's work about the underlying factors of teacher behavior. Uh, I want to talk about Vivian Robinson and uh, her work about how it is that teachers' theory of action drives their actions in the classroom. And then we want to talk about the, the kinds of people who can become these instructional leaders because they need particular capacities and characteristics to drive change effectively. So Clark and Peterson first. One of the things that we think is so important is that as leaders, we often go to one lever to try and introduce change into classroom practice, and that is through policy change, which is just sort of this external constraint. But one of the things that we think is important to recognize is that you have to interact with several other pieces before you can actually um, make a teacher or help a teacher and support a teacher to change their actions. In fact, constraints are always indirect. They affect what we know, what we believe, and what we want to do, knowledge, um, attitudes, and intent. One of the key things, one of the key shortcomings we've identified is that 90 to 95% of professional learning focuses on that top area, on knowledge. But just because someone knows how to do something does not mean that they want to do something or they believe it is worthwhile. And Clark and Peterson go into great depth about how you actually have to address attitudes and beliefs, you know, what does someone think is important or valuable before you can actually say their knowledge is going to um, bring about a change in their practice? Uh, talking about Vivian Robinson's work, I know this uh, slide has very small text. I apologize for that. Um, but the whole idea here is that if you want a teacher to change their behavior, then simply providing constraints and saying you must do X within the classroom will not actually bring about the change required unless you can can engage more deeply with their attitudes and belief, what Robinson calls their theory of action. And so if we want to bring about change, we need to pose this question to ourselves and to our teachers about what do we think is going on underneath? Can we get into their mind? And often um, a teacher themselves cannot articulate this. They cannot explain what their theory of action is. We need someone who is an expert to go into the classroom to speak in detail with them frequently and at depth with, with, with professional trust to actually understand what they believe and how that comes across in what they do. And then lastly, Matinovich um, and his colleagues talk about what a teacher leader looks like. And in mathematics, I've just made this a bit more specific, you can see they have this series of different qualities that without them, you cannot have a real um, instructional curriculum leader. Um, they can't just know the content. They've got to know how it's taught. They've got to be aware of the broader system and be embedded in that educational context. Otherwise, they won't be able to bring about you know, specific changes that respond to what teachers actually need. And so these qualities we've found time and time again, Martinovich is just one example, they show in the research base that these are the kinds of people we want working with our colleagues in schools. So uh, this brings us to the end of what I wanted to formally explain. I've got about 10 minutes, I think, which I hope will be just enough to uh, get through some of the questions. So if you um, thought about a few things throughout, I'm going to address some of the questions that are there now. Uh, and then we're going to, um, I hope a few other people have questions too. We'll see how we go for time. So the first one here by Eric, a great colleague and friend. Eddie, what are your thoughts about the world's best school prizes that have been launched by T4 Education this week? Uh, I'm tremendously excited about this. I know when the announcement came through, I thought to myself, wow, um, what is possible through this? I think that celebrating um, educators, I know, you know, Vikas Poto, who is, um, you know, who leads and who founded T4 Education, uh, he's obviously had a crucial role through the Global Teacher Prize, which is how I came in contact with this World Education Week community myself. And I've loved that, but one of the best things about the Global Teacher Prize is that it's a community being celebrated. No teacher is an island of their own practice. And you can see that in everything I've been speaking about today. So I'm thrilled um, and I'm really hopeful that many schools uh, you know, will actually step outside their comfort zone. Uh, one of the tricky things about you know, the vast majority of educators is we do not celebrate ourselves. Um, we did not come into this profession to be celebrated. We did this for the students and the communities whom we serve. So I'm really hopeful that there are going to be teachers and parents and students out there who say my school is worth celebrating and is worth sharing their practice with others. I, I think it takes a, a degree of humility to say we're not perfect, um, but I think that people can learn lessons from us and we want to share that with the community around us. So hope that answers your question, Eric. Uh, one of the questions here, uh, it's anonymous, so I'm not sure it's, who it's from, but it says, what is the biggest challenge you've experienced in engaging students in their learning and the delivery of lessons remotely due to COVID? 
Wow, okay, we could definitely talk about this for a long time. Um, but I think one of the things that stands out to me is the, the challenge, in fact, I'm experiencing it right now, of not being able to have all of the cues from the students whom I teach that I normally would within the classroom. One of the things which I love is being able to know my content well enough that I don't need to bring notes into the classroom. I can have my attention fully focused on the faces and on the posture and all the body language of my students as I'm teaching them and as I move around the room while they're doing their own independent learning. I think this is crucial. Um, I think that when we are able to uh, focus on, is a student perplexed? Um, are they are they excited? Are they passionate? Are things just clicking for them? Um, I think that it's crucial to be able to say, oh, I can respond to that um, reflexively. I don't even need my students to tell me, uh, I, I need some help here, can you please slow down? Or this is a bit tiresome, I think you can accelerate through this section. Uh, these kinds of things I miss being in, in remote access, right? Um, I'll add one more um, thought to that question just because I'm mindful of time. Um, and that's got to be the equity issue. Um, in the school that I teach, most students have you know, abundant access to technology, which I find um, is really helpful, obviously, for students being able to access video or any other materials that we put um, on the internet so that they can access it through their learning platforms. But across New South Wales and indeed across the world, we know access to technology, even not a device, but just reliable internet. Um, is very unevenly spread. And so there's a huge equity gap there that is exacerbated by COVID and by remote learning. So I think that just puts an additional emphasis on us to address those particular systemic issues and not just be about, you know, it can't just be, it's exactly about what we talked about today. It can't just be in your classroom or even within the school community. You have to look broader and address the issues that are beyond your community. So that's been a huge challenge. Uh, let's have a look. Wow, there's all these questions coming in. Um, how did the younger students get involved in Maths Pass? Were they identified and asked to come along or did they self-refer? So that's from Rhiannon Fernando. Thank you for that question. So um, there was an aspect of both. One of the things that we were conscious of is that programs which are um, entirely targeted programs. So we say to students, you know, we, we have looked at your test scores. We have seen that these are your results and we therefore think you need to participate in this. Um, whilst that can be very efficient because we have really good measures for, you know, students who might be identified and, and may benefit from these kinds of programs, we also find them to a, a certain degree, we find them student disempowered empowering because students do not have the agency to say I actually want this help and it can actually be a really disabling thing to be told you are a student who is not up to scratch and we think you need to participate in this program whether you want to or not. Now that's said there is a place uh, sometimes students are not able to self-identify and say actually you know uh, I, I think I need help. I, I, I realize that there is this help available. Uh, and so there is a role for teachers to be active in saying, um, I think that there's an opportunity for you here for you to take take advantage of. But we find that coercing students into these programs um, is, is more often problematic than helpful. So we are always offering this assistance and we want students to want to be there and we try and make the most compelling case for this. And uh, we're able to do that quite successfully because our tutors, our older students who participate are friendly, they're personal, they're engaging. Um, we're very selective, even though so many students apply, you saw how many, um, I think it was, you know, almost a quarter of the grade applied to be part of the program. We didn't permit all of them. We were very, very careful about who we chose. It wasn't just if you wanted to, or if you had good marks, um, you could come in. But they needed to demonstrate that they actually had the personal and communication skills, as well as the academic rigor to participate. And that ensured that younger students saw these students, they knew them, they were often student leaders across the school and other spheres, and they would say, that's someone who I want to be taught by, that's someone who I think I can have a conversation with. So um, that's how those younger students got involved. Okay, I think, wow, this is so challenging. I've got many questions coming through. Um, I'm going to uh, just pick one more and then um, I'm going to then hand over to my wonderful producers who I'm going to acknowledge in a second. Um, okay, here's one last question, which is just at the end here. Again, it's from someone anonymous. How can teacher training 
change to ensure new teacher graduates come out with the skill sets for mathematics teacher leadership wow what a fabulous question um look i think there are a couple of different ways that this can be addressed the first one is to actually say that every teacher within you know pre-service training um, should be thinking about themselves as a leader um, i don't think that was introduced to me at the start um, i think there was a focus understandably on, you know, know your curriculum and also be able to, you know, manage classroom behavior and understand the nature of a school. And of course, there is a really important role for that to start at the ground level because you can't be a leader unless you have that authentic practice and understanding in the first place. But I think for many years, even after I entered the teaching profession, I did not think of myself as a leader, even though I was obviously a leader within my classroom and I sort of became a leader sort of by, you know, uh, by accident looking behind me and seeing people, you know, trying to learn off of my own practice. I think taking our pre-service teachers and, and saying within their teacher training, you are a leader in, you know, that this is the only way which you are going to learn and help develop the next generation as well. Um, I think having that as something which is a, a, a assumed mindset for all people who go into education, I think that's crucial. Um, a second thing which I think is important is to make sure that there are uh, mentorship structures built into um, all the way through as you're a pre-service teacher that you spend a lot of time within schools. Um, I know there are some uh, programs which I, I, I think bring teachers into schools without giving them the amount of time within schools and developing those relationships and professional networks that are th so necessary. Um, and then further, sometimes the jurisdictions struggle to actually assign mentors in a systematic way to their early career teachers. And I think that's um, problematic. It's one of the reasons for the huge teacher attrition rate across the world, because we do not provide that wraparound support to teachers when they begin in the profession. And we all know here in the room, education is one of the um, most a rude awakenings you can come into because you think you know the system. Um, you've been part of it for, you know, past 12 or 13 or 15 years. And you think, I know how this works. But then it's actually quite a rude awakening when you realize as an educator standing on the other side of the room, um, there is so much that you don't know. So that wraparound support uh, and that, those professional networks, I think, have to be, there's a system responsibility to actually provide that, that structure uh, and not rely on uh, schools and individual teachers to say, I, I will mentor the people coming from behind me. Um, I think that we have to do that from a system point of view. So um, there are still more questions here, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who's engaged with this. And if you're watching this later on, um, thank you for um, taking some time to, to watch this, and I hope you found it helpful. For anyone who wants the slides, please just get in touch. Any of the um, you know the social media platforms that I mentioned before, you'll be able to find my contact details through there, um, or you can just Google Eddie Wu. That'll do. Um, thank you for your time, and I want to acknowledge. Um, my wonderful technical producers, Louise and Alison, who are fellow educators like me, they have done such an incredible job. I wouldn't be able to speak to you or do anything. Uh, and they've been very helpful, even through school holidays here in New South Wales. They have just gone above and beyond. So I want to thank them um, and everyone who's uh, yeah, tuned in. Uh, but lastly, I want to say thank you to the sponsors. Um, T4 Education, like I mentioned, has put together this huge event, um, but it's been a great uh, cost and effort for many people. And so now as we, uh, you know, re you, you respond to them, I want to make sure that you get to watch um, their messages. So thank you one last time for your time today, whether it's late in the evening or early in the morning. I hope you found today useful. Uh, take care and I hope to hear from some of you soon. Bye for now. Join Time Magazine's lead education reporter alongside global educators and advocates to explore the impacts of teaching forgiveness. I teach forgiveness because it can have a positive impact in my students' families. It helps my students thrive in the face of adversity. Students who can forgive are happier. Join us to hear from teachers and thought leaders on how and why to include forgiveness in your classroom.
future rise will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water.